Okay, so in this video we're going to take a look at ideal gases as part of the thermal physics part of the course. Um, so by the time you finish watching this, you should be able to um, describe the properties of an ideal gas and um, how we ensure real gases are able to be modelled as an, as an ideal gas. We're going to look at uh, Boyle, Charles and the pressure law. So you should be able to state what those are and how we'd experimentally test each of those laws. And then we're going to finish off looking at two equations, the ideal gas law and the equation of state. And we'll explain how we use those to um, actually figure out what absolute zero is. So that's what we're going to take a look at. So let's dive in. So uh, an ideal gas is one we can consider to have the following properties. So these are assumptions we make when we model a gas as an ideal gas. And we'll talk about in a second when that's appropriate. So, First off, we model the motion of all the particles as perfectly random, so there's no predictability or anything about the motion of the particles. The path every particle takes is entirely random. So we assume that every collision that occurs is perfectly elastic, so the total kinetic energy is conserved in every collision. Uh, we say that there are no intermolecular forces, uh, that's the most problematic of these assumptions and we'll look at how we can minimise that kind of, uh, problem later. And we say that the volume of the gas particles is negligible compared to the volume of the container. So if these four are reasonably assumed, we can model something as an ideal gas. Okay, so uh, how can we ensure that a real gas can be modelled like an ideal gas? Well, uh, if it's going to be a valid assumption, we need these conditions on the left to be uh, in place. If it's going to be an invalid model, these thing conditions will be the case. So if we want to model a real gas as an ideal gas, what we need to make sure is the pressure is sufficiently low, because um, that allows the particles to be nice and spread out, so the intermolecular forces are not going to play much a part. And we need it to be very high temperature, so that the particles are travelling very quickly, um, so that actually during the collisions the intermolecular forces, one, don't have time to act, and two, are small compared to the forces of the collisions. However, um, the ideal gas model will not work if we have high pressure, so we have all the particles packed close together, or the particles are travelling very slowly, so actually the intermolecular force is now significant. So for these ones, we can't model gases as uh, real gases as ideal ones. If we have these conditions, we can, and so these are the ones we're going to be interested in. Okay, so let's first look at Boyle's law. So we've got a nice picture of Robert Boyle here. Uh, you may or may not be able to see the massive hair, which seems to be the trend of uh, him and Isaac Newton and all those guys back in the day. Um, if you can't see this, just Google it and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, so his law states that for an ideal gas, the pressure times the volume should be equal to a constant if the temperature stays the same, and that is a big if. So constant temperature, what that means is pressure and volume are inversely proportional to one another, is another way of expressing the same thing. So who is this guy? Um, well, he's originally from Ireland, and he is essentially he's considered the founder of modern chemistry and one of the pioneers of the scientific method. So the method by which we make a hypothesis, we, des uh, we design it and experiment to test it and try and prove our hypothesis wrong, and then if we can't, maybe it will be accepted. That's kind of the method, and he's one of the pioneers of this model. So, a uh, pretty awesome guy. Uh, do Google him if you want to know more about him and his other experiments and that kind of thing. So that's Boyle's law. So how can we actually test whether this law is valid or not? Well, what we need is some equipment like this. So we have a uh, syringe or a piston here, uh, in which essentially it's sealed. So we've got a fixed mass of gas sealed inside this container. And we've got a plunger, which would allow us to vary the volume of this, and we have some gauges to measure the pressure and the temperature. So what you do is you push down uh, this piston or plunger here, and that would change the volume, and you would have a look at your pressure gauge to see at your new volume what is the pressure, and you make sure your temperature gauge still set the same value, so we've kept temperature the same. That is the idea behind testing his model. And what you do is you plot a graph of pressure 
against 1 over volume. Why? Well, Boyle's law said pressure and volume are inversely proportional, and another way of expressing that is that pressure is directly proportional to 1 over volume. So, if his law is correct, when we plot pressure against 1 over volume, we should get a straight line graph passing through the origin, so it's a directly proportional relationship, and if we do, that gives us one piece of evidence that maybe this law is correct. That's not conclusive to prove it by any means, but it's just one piece of evidence that goes, hmm, yeah, this seems like it might be okay. All right, so that's Boyle's law. So the question you might ask at this point is, well, you know, like, where does his hypothesis even come from? Like, why did he say that these two things are diamond proportional? Well, you don't actually need to know that to go about testing the relationship between variables. What we can do is use logarithms as our help to actually find these relationships. So, what we're going to say is essentially pressure can be calculated from volume using some numbers. So we've got a constant k in front, and we've got some power that we don't know, so I've called it b there. There's, you can pick any letters you like, it still works. So if you take the log of both sides, it doesn't matter what base logarithm you use, as long as you use the same on both sides. Then we're going to use our logarithm rules here, so you should know that the log of k times v to the b is the same as log k plus log v to the b. And you should know that log v to the power of b is equal to b log v there. So we end up with this expression here at the bottom, which is a straight line graph if you plot the right things on the right axis. So, uh, we're going to make log p our y, so you can see that here, and we're going to make log v our x, so you can see that here. So uh, that must mean b is m, so our gradient is going to be v here, and log k must be our c, so that our y-intercept should be log k. And if Boyle's law is correct, we should find b is minus 1, because they're supposed to be inversely proportional, so the power of minus 1 is the same as 1 over. Um, so that's how we could go about finding this if we didn't know or have a hypothesis uh, that a direct report on that. We could use logs to solve this. Uh, but let's not worry about that too much. Okay, so that's Boyle's law. So now we're going to move on and look at some of the other laws that were um, hypothesized and tested um, about the behavior of gases. Okay, so next we're going to look at Charles' law. Uh, this is Charles over here. Um, so, sorry, Jacques Charles uh, should be great, and from his name you might uh, guess he is French, and you would be correct. So what Charles' law states is that for an ideal gas, the volume and temperature are directly proportional to each other if you keep the pressure the same. Okay, and that works if you measure temperature on the Kelvin scale. It does not work if you measure it on the Celsius or Fahrenheit or any other scale that you dream of. This is in the Kelvin scale, which all thermodynamicists and scientists use typically. Okay, so that's Charles' law. And just for a point of interest, uh, Boyle's law was published in 1662. Uh, that's when Robert Boyle was hard at work. Charles' law, you'll notice, is over 100 years later in 1780. So progress on this was not particularly speedy at the time. This took a long time to develop. Um, but let's dig into how we can test Charles' law. So typically, we use a different piece of kit called a capillary tube to test Charles' law. So just to show you what we've got here, uh, this is your capillary tube here, and this is just a way of measuring the volume. That's the scale of size. So what we've got is some air trapped beneath some oil here. Okay, so we've got some trapped air, and then we've got a top that is open to the surroundings. So, because it's open to the surroundings, that's what allows us to keep pressure the same, because the pressure is always going to be atmospheric pressure because it is open to the surroundings, and the pressure will always equalise. So if we heat it and change the temperature, what we'll see is the volume of this trapped gas is going to change and allow us to investigate the relationship between temperature and volume there. Okay, so that's what we're going to do, and we'll get a graph of volume against temperature, and if Charles' law is correct, that will be a directly proportional graph, or a straight line passing through the origin. So that's how we can test Charles' law. Okay. Uh, the third law to do with like essentially ideal gases is called the pressure law. 
Um, for those of you wondering why this one isn't named after anyone like Boyle or Charles Law, uh, it probably should be. It should be named after uh, Joseph de Roussac, who is the discoverer of the pressure law. However, his name might have uh, incited mockery of the law. Uh, these were not very tolerant times that he was working in, sadly. Um, so it's just known as the pressure law. And the pressure law states that the pressure is directly proportional to the temperature, again, temperature measured in Kelvin there. Um, so some background on uh, Gay Lussac. He was one of the first uh, scientists who actually went up into the atmosphere and did experiments up there using a hot air balloon. He went something like seven kilometers up. And he's also uh, discovered iodine, the element, and invented the modern pipette and burette. So a fairly multi-skilled guy, and basically uh, all of you chemists out there use his equipment a lot. It's a slightly different piece of kit to do this experiment. What we've got is a sealed container. And what that means is we've tracked the fixed mass again inside the container, but its volume cannot change. So uh, before we had a piston where the, the volume could change, here the volume cannot change because of the sealed container. So what we're going to do is we can heat up the, this gas chamber. So we heat the water and measure the temperature of the water, and we can measure the pressure using a pressure gauge up there. So what we do is we plot a graph of pressure against temperature, and again, we should find a straight line graph going through the origin if the pressure law is correct, that pressure and temperature are directly proportional at fixed volume. So now having got these three different laws and tested them, what we can do is put them all together and get this equation. So pressure times volume is equal to some sort of constant times the temperature measured in Kelvin. So let's dig into that a little more and develop our ideal gas law. Okay, so this is where we just finished the last slide, PV equals KT. So with some more testing, what they discovered is this K constant was equal to number of moles, this little n, times a molar gas constant, a, just a fixed number, 8.31. So uh, what is a mole? Um, a mole is a certain number of atoms or moles of a substance. More specifically, it is 6.023 times 10 to the 23 atoms or molecules of a substance, which is often called Avogadro's number after a scientist who did a lot of research in this field. So n is the number of moles that we've got, or the number of sets of this number of atoms, and our molar gas constant of 8.31 stays the same the whole time. Um, so we end up with PV equals nRT, and that's called the ideal gas equation. Um, so, that's our ideal gas equation. The other equation you'll come across a lot in this topic is called the equation of state, which is very closely related to the ideal gas equation. So, all we're going to do is just a little bit of uh, mathematical jiggery-pokery. So all we're going to do is we're going to multiply n by Avogadro's number. Because that, in this whole term in brackets, is now just going to be the number of atoms of your substance. Because you've done the number of moles times Avogadro's number. Okay? So to make that still balance, we're going to divide R by Avogadro's number. So, this is called another kind of constant. So R over Avogadro's number is known as the Boltzmann constant. And that will be in your formula book, and you can look up what that is. And this big N is the number of atoms or number of molecules of a substance that, that you're dealing with. So depending on what information you're given, you'll choose which of these two laws to use there to deal with. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do is look at how we can use this to determine absolute zero. And what we can do is use either of these two laws right here, either P equals KT or V equals KT, and use those to determine the minimum possible temperature uh, there. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep, uh, in this case, let's keep volume the same. So if we keep volume the same, we plot a graph of pressure against temperature, and we collect these results, and we explain how you do that earlier. So if you extrapolate the straight line back, to where it hits the x-axis, that tells you the minimum possible temperature of the gas, or the temperature at which pressure becomes zero. So 
that would give you a value of absolute zero, which is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, or we call it zero Kelvin. Okay, so what is this absolute zero? Well, it's the temperature at which the kinetic energy of the particles is minimized, and actually the potential energy is also minimized at this point. So, uh, that's absolute zero, and it's impossible to go lower than absolute zero. It's the minimum possible temperature you can achieve, and it's not zero energy, I would note, it's the minimum energy. They're still slightly vibrating at this point, um, but it's the minimum energy there. So, those of you sitting there thinking, well, couldn't we just kept pressure the same and done that with volume and temperature? Yes, absolutely you can, and that would come out exactly the same. You just have volume there and you go through the same method, and that will be totally fine. But that's how we can work out what absolute zero is, and this is where this value can come from. Okay, so uh, that concludes what I'm going to look at in this video. So uh, let's just check what you should know at this point. Um, so you should be able to tell me uh, what an ideal gas is, the properties that make an ideal gas, and how we make a real gas behave like an ideal gas. You should be able to tell me what the three different laws of gases are and how we can test whether those equations or laws are valid. And you should be able to uh, state what the ideal gas law is and the equation of state is and use the ideal gas law to determine absolute zero by keeping either pressure or volume constant. So that's what you should be able to do. Um, if you have any questions at this point, please do feel free to comment and I would be happy to get back to you to see if I can answer your questions. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video.